All right, let's start talking about the next part of this process. And this is the synthesis of state machines. So in the analysis part that we've been doing for the past few lectures, we started with a circuit that we were told was a state machine, and we went through an analysis process leading to a state diagram that we could use to understand what the machine does. We want to do the reverse process now. We want to start with a state diagram and from there, try to work up to an actual circuit that will realize that particular set of state transitions. So let's just begin with um, a state machine that we've seen before. This was our um, weather predicting model. And I'll just label these. in kind of the usual way. And remember we had um, our key said we've got a state followed by a prediction. I'll call that Z, that's our output. And our prediction was sunny, sunny, cloudy, cloudy. And then we had an input going in. And the input was one if today was sunny, a zero if it was cloudy. So if we have a 1, we stay in this state. If we have a 0, we go here. Another 0 brings us here. Another 0 here. And zeros leave us in this state. And 1s move us in the other direction. So if you don't remember the details of this machine, that's okay. It's not important. This is just a, an example of a state diagram where we're going to analyze it and um, come up with a machine that will, um, if we were to analyze that machine, give us this state diagram. So here are the steps. Um, so this is state machine synthesis. So start with state diagram. see how many states you have and based on that decide how many flip-flops we need all right so we start with a state diagram see how many states we have well that's just four right four states and how many flip-flops well it's not always um, a single answer but um, certainly, if we have two flip-flops, we can represent four different states, because two bits, one per flip-flop, we have four combinations. So I'm going to say two flip-flops, but we will see cases where we might want more than two flip-flops to represent four states. Um, we'll talk about that in another class. But for now, you know, simplest case, two flip-flops. Um, and let me add a question here, what types? Because we can build a state machine with D flip-flops, T flip-flops, JK flip-flops, SR flip-flops. Um, we have our choice. And sometimes, you know, we may be told, like on a homework problem or a test problem, use JK flip-flops or use 1D and 1T. Or it may be that, you know, for whatever reason, the only devices we have available to us are D flip-flops. Um, so something will make this, this distinction. In general, we'll see that if we use a JK flip-flop, it's more work to come up with a circuit, but the circuit will be simpler in the end. Um, but the easiest case to work with is going to be D flip-flops, because D flip-flops have the simplest behavior. So I'm just going to say let's use two D flip-flops. All right. And then we're going to make a state assignment table. So if I was given this diagram, these states would have been called, you know, definitely sunny, mostly sunny, mostly cloudy, definitely cloudy. Or maybe I said probably instead of mostly. Um, but, you know, I've given them names that will make it easy to create a state assignment table. So here's what this table looks like. State name. 
and then I'm going to have a pair of flip-flops with a pair of outputs Q1, Q0 and so I'll assign those values based on the state in you know the way we've been doing this since the beginning of state machines but if you have different names you know put those names in pick an assignment and it doesn't really matter well there's nothing that tells us you know that this state should be 0 0 as opposed to 0 1 or 1 0 if this state is called um, probably sunny right does that mean we should have two zeros or a zero one there's no way to tell right and in the end we can make any assignments we want between these states and the values of q1 and q0 as long as each combination corresponds to a different state um, but it will change what the circuit looks like in the end and a very good tool set might do some pre-analysis and decide you know oh if i made this state zero one and this state zero zero my circuitry ends up being simpler we're not going to worry about that right so this is effectively you know just kind of created at random um but you know i've chosen these names because they'll be easy to remember all right so we've got our state assignment table now for the big step um make a state transition table and so here we're going to make a big wide table that shows us how our system moves from one state to another all right and so what is this going to look like um, it's going to look like um, present state name present state flip-flop outputs so we'll list the name of a present state we'll list what the corresponding flip-flop outputs are and we'll list what the inputs are and then for each of those we'll list the outputs and then we'll list the next state name and that's going to come you know directly from our diagram but then if we know the name of the next state we'll list next state um, flip-flop outputs so what do we want the cues to be and then depending on what type of flip-flops we're using um, we should be able to figure out what the required flip-flop inputs are to generate those flip-flop outputs when the clock ticks so that's basically the table we need to fill out once we've got that done we can write equations for the outputs and the flip-flop inputs and then we draw our circuit so let's look at this in this particular example let's start this state transition table so here's present state name and we're going to list present state um, flip-flop outputs so um, we're gonna have two D flip-flops we'll call them you know D1 D0 so we're gonna have outputs Q1 Q0 and then I'm going to list our one input which is X and we're going to have eight rows here so if we're in state zero zero and our input is a zero then we're in this state our input is a zero our next state should be one zero and if we're in zero zero um, our output should be a one so i can draw my output here which is going to be z and then um, next state name and I'm not going to worry about present state q1 q0 I'm just going to look at present state input output next state all right so if we're in state 00 um, our output is going to be a 1 
And if our input is 0, our next state is S10. If we're in 0, 0 and our input is a 1, well, our output is still a 1 because it's a more machine. The output's based on the present state. But if we're in 0, 0 and our input is a 1, our next state is S01. And so we're going to have eight possibilities. We could be in state 0, 1 with our input of 0 or 1. We could be in state 1, 0 with an input of 0, 1. Or we could be in state 1, 1 with an input of 0, 1. Those are the only possibilities. And we're just going to fill in the output and the next state from our diagram. Well, the output is, is relatively easy for a more machine. It only depends on the state. So if we're in state 0, 1, our output is a 1. If we're in state 1, 0, our output is a 0. And if we're in state 1, 1, our output is a 0. So let's just fill in the next state now. If we're in 0, 1, that's right here, and our input is a 0, our next state is S, 0, 0. If we're in 0, 1, and our input is a 1, our next state is still S, 0, 1. If we're in 1, 0, that's down here, and our input is a 0, we're going to go to state S11. And if we're in 1, 0, and our input is a 1, we're going to go to state 0, 0. So 1, 0, input is a 1, we go to S00. And finally, if we're in S11 and our input is a 0, we stay in that state. But if we're in S11 and our input is a 1, we change to S. One zero. All right, we're through with the diagram. We've captured all of the information from that diagram into this part of our table. So now we can fill in the actual Q values corresponding to these states. Right, this would come from our, our state name table. So um, the way I've written this, Those are the values of Q. And now let's write our next state in terms of flip-flop outputs. So I can, I can write this as Q1 plus Q0 plus. Sometimes you see it with asterisk. Sometimes it just says next state. But this is the values of Q corresponding to this new state that I want to be in after the clock ticks. So this is 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. And now we have required flip-flop inputs. Well, these are D flip-flops because we decided we were working with D. So there's a D1 input and there's a D0 input. And the reason D flip-flops are the easiest one to de design with is because with a D flip-flop, if we want the output to be 1 after a clock tick, we just set the input to 1. If we want the output to be 0 after a clock tick, we set the input to 0. Now that's only for D flip-flops, right? If this was a toggle flip-flop, we would need to look at the current value, and we'd say, hey, if we want the flip-flop to be a 1 after the clock tick, well, currently the output's a 0, that means we want the clock tick to toggle, so we would set the T input to 1. But if the flip-flop is currently outputting a 1, and after the clock tick we want it to remain a 1, then we say we do not want this flip-flop to toggle, and so we would set the T input to 0. So we can't just look at this next value of Q and write it down. We'd have to know what the current value of Q is. That's for a T flip-flop, and a similar thing happens with JKs. But for a D flip-flop, Whatever we want the new value of the flip-flop to be, that's exactly what we set the D input to. So for that case only, D flip-flops, the required inputs just match the next state outputs. All right, well, this is the state transition table, right? So this is what we want our machine to do. We want to build a set of circuitry so that if we have a pair of D flip-flops with these values coming out and we have an input of zero, then the D inputs get set to this pair of values. 
So how did we do that? Well, this is, you know, early engineering 250, late CSE 120. We look at the truth table and we write equations. So um, let's start with the output Z. So our, our next step is write equations for the outputs and the flip-flop inputs. All right, the outputs are right here, and the flip-flop inputs are right here. And then sketch a circuit. All right, well, writing these equations is a whole subtask in itself. But let's start with, with the simpler cases. Let's start with Z. And we can make an observation that if Q1 is 0, Z is 1. If Q1 is 1, Z is 0. So Z is actually just equal to Q1 bar. Now, if we didn't make that observation, we could do what we're going to do for these other um, columns. We'll do, you know, uh, K-map, fill in the 1s, cover rectangles, find a simplified expression. Or if we don't care about how complex our expression is, just write a sum of products, right? So I could write Z equals Q1 bar, Q0 bar, um, or, um, sorry, Q1 bar, Q0 bar, X bar, or Q1 bar, Q0 bar, X, or Q1 bar, Q0, X bar, or Q1 bar, Q0, X. And if we write that and we put it into a K-map and we simplify, we'll find out Z is just equal to Q1 bar. All right, so let's, let's carefully make a K-map for D1 and figure out what an equation for D1 is. So let me label this D1, and let me make a 4 by 2. And on this axis, I'll list Q1, Q0. And on the horizontal axis, I'll list X. So this is 0 and 1 for X. This is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0 for Q1, Q0. And I want to fill in um, the desired input for D1. So if everything is a 0, I want D1 to be a 1. If we're in 1, 0 with an input of 0, I want D1 to be 1. So 1, 0 with an input of 0 is right there. And these last two cases where Q1, Q0 are 1, regardless of X, I want my D1 to be a 1. So that's a pair of 1s right here. So that's the K-map corresponding to D1. And I can cover this with a pair of rectangles. I can do one here, and I can do a broken one here. And this rectangle looks like Q1, Q0. And this rectangle looks like Q1 doesn't matter, but we need Q0 bar, X bar. And so we want to OR those. D1 equals Q1, Q0, or um, Q0 bar, X bar. So that's our equation for D1. And let me write that down here. And now let's do D0. So I'll do the same 4 by 2 K map. I'll label the edges, being careful of this ordering from 1, 1 to 1, 0. And now we'll fill in the entries for D0. Well, it looks like 0, 0, 1. So 0, 0, 1, we want a 1 right there. It looks like 0, 1, 1, we want a 1. So that's right here. It looks like 1, 0, 0. So 1, 0, 0. And finally, 1, 1, 0, right there. So those are the 1s for D0. And we can do a pair of rectangles for that. This turns out to be Q1 X bar. This turns out to be um, Q1 bar X. And so D0 is just the sum of those. 
And so let's write that down. D0 equals Q1 X bar or Q1 bar X. All right, so we've got equations for the outputs from the circuit, which is Z and the flip-flop inputs D1 and D0. Now we can sketch the circuit. And there's different ways to do this, but we'll, we'll do this in a way that should come out fairly orderly. So let me draw my two flip-flops. And here's D0 and D1. Here's Q0, Q0 bar, Q1, Q1 bar. These are clocked, so they're edge trigger devices, so I'll show the clock there. Um, and our output is the easiest thing to draw. Z is just equal to Q1 bar, so I'm just going to take a line from here and bring that out to Z. That's our output. All right, now we need some logic. Our logic is going to combine the Q's and X. X is an input. So let me bring X down like this. And let me bring X bar like this. And let me also bring out my Q's. So this is X, this is X bar, this is Q0. This is Q0 bar. So this is a bit of overkill. This is Q1. And this is Q1 bar. And our circuitry is not this complex. We could probably just draw this directly from the equations and come out reasonably. But let's do this in a way that is reproducible for more complex circuits. So D1 comes out of an, an, a sum of two products, right? So we want Q1, Q0 to be anded together. So I didn't leave myself enough room in here. That's okay. Let's take Q1 and Q0. Let's and those. And then let's take Q0 bar, X bar. So here's Q0 bar, X bar. Let's and those. Let's put those through an OR gate. And that should be the value of D1. So that's going to go down here into D1. And then D0, um, we want Q1 anded with X bar. So I'm going to take Q1 X bar. I'm going to and those together. And I'm going to take Q1 bar X. So here's Q1 bar X. I'm going to and those. So that's these two terms. I'm going to OR them together. And that's going to go into D0. And then the clock, I'm going to take these two clock lines and tie them together. And that's our clock input. And there we go. There's a state machine circuit. Now, you know, if, if I did this on scratch paper, I would redraw it. And I would move these over so I had more space for this. And I would get rid of, you know, the lines that I don't use. I would get rid of this X line down here and so on and so forth. You can neaten this up. But this captures all of the information we need for um, a full state machine to implement that original diagram. And this is pretty easy to follow, right? If, if you lay it out like this, um, it's pretty clear, you know, we've got all of the inputs and all of the flip-flop outputs running vertically here, and we can follow which ones are connected um, to generate product terms, which products do we sum, and what inputs do those feed, and where does the output come from, and so on. So, um, so that's you know an example of start to finish, state diagram to circuit, right? And it's it's an inverse of the steps that we used for analysis. So, start with a state diagram, 
see how many states you have, decide how many flip-flops, what types of flip-flops, make your state assignment table, right? So you know which combinations of flip-flops correspond to which state, and then make your transition table, all right? That's this big long thing. So present state, input, output, next state, and then based on that, figure out what your flip-flop inputs need to be to make that the next state. And once you've got that filled in, write your equations and then sketch a circuit. All right, that's all there is to it, but it's a lot of work, right? We spent this whole time on a single um, diagram with only one input, two flip-flops, and a pretty easy output because it's, it's a more machine. Um, with more complex diagrams, obviously, this gets to be more work. And a lot of places you can go wrong. And, you know, if I, if I accidentally write a 1 here instead of a 0, I'm going to get a totally different circuit. I'm just not going to do the same thing. If I take this and I analyze it, I'll get some different behavior. So lots of room for, for small errors, which is another reason why working methodically is really important. Because if your circuit looks nothing like what I'm expecting, but I can follow your work and say, oh, that should have been a 0, you wrote a 1, not a big deal. Right? But if I can't follow your work and all I see is a circuit that's not correct, there's no partial credit, right? So I've got to be able to see how you got to this circuit. So working methodically, showing your work, working as neatly as possible, really, really important for these types of questions. All right. So that's, that's our first example of state machine synthesis. You'll have some questions in the practice problems to work with. Um, and then in the next video, we're going to... Um, go a little deeper, we'll do um, a synthesis question where we use T flip-flops, and then we'll use JK flip-flops. And JK flip-flops are very different, and you'll see why they give us such a simpler design. It's because we're going to be able to put in some don't-care states, and that's going to help us a lot. Um, so that'll be the next video um, coming up. All right, thanks.